All right, good evening, everyone. I am Grace. I am your host for the evening. We have Reading, Writing, and Ralph tonight, as always. Ralph Peluso will be your host, and he is welcoming Rita Mattia to discuss her book, Trying Stuff. And as always, we will have trivia throughout the night, and it will be flashed up on the screen, and I will type it in the comments box. So if you think you know the answer, please respond in the comments box, and you might just win a little something. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Ralph. Hi, Grace. How are you today? Hi, Ralph. I'm good. Thank you. How are you? That's, that's good. Tonight's prizes are an autographed copy of Rita's book, uh, Trying Stuff. It's a very captivating um, memoirs of her life as um, um, an Italian immigrant living living and growing up in New, New Jersey and in other places, and it's a fascinating read. So uh, let's get Rita on and get uh, get cracking. Hi, Rita. Hey, Rita. How are you? <laughs> okay, I'm fine. That's great. That's great. It's another it's a Jersey girl. We have a lot of Jersey girls living here in um, uh, Bridgeville, Delaware at Heritage Shores. And uh, so well, you fit right in. When I went to the university, it, there were a lot of kids from Jersey there. Did you go to University of Delaware? If you... I could probably get big bucks for my yearbook because I was in Joe's class. You were in Joe. You and Joe were classmates. Yep. Well, and the school that, was very up. small. Thing. I mean, you knew everybody. <laughs> Good old Joe. So we uh, we like to start off uh, by helping the viewers get to know you. So tell tell our audience a little bit about yourself, your background. Um, what you did, what you didn't do. <laughs> and tonight we're not gonna talk about organized family business operations, okay? <laughs> My, I was, I was born in, it's interesting I, to me, I was born in, uh, in New Jersey, in a little hospital in a little town called Kearney, but I grew up in a town called Lyndhurst that was very um, culturally not diverse. And so the majority of, of people that I went to school with and that were our neighbors uh, were uh, of Italian descent and some were of Polish descent. And everyone, everyone was white and almost everyone was Roman Catholic. And what that kind of does when you're growing up is it gives you a very narrow idea of what the world is like. You know, it, it's just... It does this to you, and so uh, one of the funnier stories that I've I've told people uh, is that my parents and I went on a road trip. We left New Jersey and headed west, and we stopped in Ohio that first night. And my parents came outside and sat on chairs, and I thought they were going to be killed by mosquitoes because you did not leave the house in the summertime in New Jersey. I mean, the mosquitoes. Because of the mosquitoes yeah. or because of, well, depending where you are in New Jersey, it could be well, we interesting. Well, next swamp, so, uh, or the Meadowlands, as it is called, more classily. So that's where I grew up um, with this narrow worldview. And I thought every high school smelled like garlic, and that, it didn't. I, I found that out later. And went off to the University of Delaware, majoring in my dearest love, chemistry not that was my major i really didn't like it and after a year i switched over to uh to get an english degree and my father said fine you'll be unemployed for the rest of your life sometimes i have been but most of the time i've not and so i spent uh i spent a year working in manhattan and couldn't find the real job i had a great job working not great a funny job working at an, a greeting card company's headquarters. And my job was to answer consumer complaint mail. And so I had this pen name, Alice Wright. And Alice <laughs> Wright would answer every letter with all sorts of sincerity. And people would ask me things like, 
Why do you never put sloths on the birthday cards? Good question. So that, so that was my job for a while, but I really, I was not happy living at home. I was not happy with anything that was going on. And I escaped one day to Baltimore where I had friends from college. And uh, there I started a career in advertising. In the next 50 years, I was an advertising copywriter. And uh, when I retired from that, I just started trying different things. I had a business for a while, um, restoring vintage photographs. I did some fine art photography and had a couple of really good shows in Fredericksburg, which is a very arty town. And uh, then, I guess about a year and a half ago, I decided it was time to write a book. Because when I'm with people, or when people visit me, I have such an interesting family history. My Italian family is so interesting that I, I wind up telling stories all the time. And I thought, why not write them down? So a lot of those stories, or some of them, are in my book. Um, and I was just saying to someone today, you know, you watch shows like Finding Our Roots and some tremendously famous person has a far less interesting family than I do. <laughs> <laughs> they, just have a, they just have a wider audience, that's all. <laughs> they do indeed. They, they draw in the people the sponsor wants. So right. that's me in a nutshell. So in the, in, there's a couple of things. You wrote some very interesting stories about your time in um, the advertising business. Yes, I did. And one, one particular one is called Louisville. Because oh, you have a, your own personalized Louisville bat. I do. I do. I can hold it up right now. Ta-da! There it is. Yes. It's, and my I'm, I'm going to reach for. Um, I, too, have a personalized Louisville bat. And, and this, is, this, is my, this is my hat that I, I would be wearing right now if I was watching the game. So, yeah. Now that I, is... I, um, baseball fan, but my, my, my Louisville uh, adventure was as an advertising professional. I was a, what they call a creative director at an agency in Richmond. And I was invited to Louisville to judge their annual award show for good work. And um, I've always joked that someone who was really good was pro probably turned it down or got sick, but I had a lot of fun. I'd ne never been to Louisville before. That's how I got my bat. It was waiting for me on my bed. And um, this, uh, this writer who was there, she was, she was from the um, trade press. She worked for Advertising Age, or one of those kind of magazines. She and I became great friends. And the story is about sneaking into the Humana building so that we could get up to the top and see the view. And while we were up there, we just kept doing finding things that would amuse ourselves. And so... For a while, we tap danced, and then we sat down at a piano and played some songs and sang. And just did a, what anybody would do if they were at the Humana Center, right? When we were sneaking out of the building, the security guard said, we love the show. <laughs> <laughs> it must have been quite a show, quite a show. It, Talking about we, shows, uh, being from uh, New Jersey, I'm sure... <laughs> You spent time at Palisades Park. Oh my gosh! Oh. And I'm sure that you've seen we're there for the Bruce Morrow show on Fridays and Saturday nights. Nah, I was not because I was such a oh. sheltered person that my parents would never have, never have so we, known. We, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah, Bruce we're going to warm the we're going to warm the audience up with the first trivia question of the night. Uh, we have three questions. The winners get an autographed copy of uh, Rita's uh, fine book, trying, trying Stuff. And the first question is, what legendary music star, after appearing at Palisades Park with Bruce Morrow, never spoke to him again and why? This is the toughest of the three questions. Again, yeah. what legendary music star or performer Stop talking to Cousin Bruce after his their performance at Palisades Park and why? So Palisades Park was such a cool place to go. 
And uh, that kind of amusement park was eclipsed by the big theme parks, but it was just good, clean fun. We, we went a lot and th we have a picture here that we can show uh, called Coney Island. Let's see if we can bring that up. Yeah, there you go. This is my, the gentleman in the funny, funny folded hat was my great grandfather's brother, Richard. And the woman with the very funny hat next to him was his wife. And the rest are his kids. And they're at wow. Coney Island posing in a car on the boardwalk. Now, wow. yeah, I know. What makes that somewhat interesting is that it gives you a sense of what a massive family I really have. My great grandfather and his brother both were blessed to have eight children make it past infancy. And then they all had children and then they all had children. So I have hundreds of cousins. Hundreds. And uh, some of them are in my stories. All of them are in my heart. <laughs> <laughs> you asked me, um, I think you were going to ask me what got me started writing. Yeah, what got you started? There's a lot of people, a reason people write memoirs anywhere from wanting to tell the stories of their family, making sure mm -hmm. that their family history is written down or for therapeutical purposes, you know, a little of both. So how did you choose to write memoirs, these stories, and why? Well, because I was a Sputnik kid, because I was growing up during those the Cold War, I get pushed and pushed and pushed, and that's how I wound up, of all things, majoring in chemistry, which I walked away from. And it, but I knew in my heart, I knew I was a writer, and this is kind of this is kind of interesting, and this really is the genesis. This is called Science Book Report, Rita Mattia, Physics, Period 3. <laughs> and on the back, it says this from my physics teacher. You write so well. I believe I've already spoken to you about this. Your report is good to the point and not laborious. A, A, A. And I still think you should consider writing as a career. So, of course, then I went and majored in chemistry and really flunked everything. And eventually I started writing advertising and what would happen is that I'd have downtime or whatever and I'd write on a typewriter, I'd write some little essay about my family, about my life, whatever, and toss them in a box. And I, the box was called Rita Writes. And uh, about a year and a half ago, I was moving from one apartment to another and thought, oh, this is a damn box. What's in there? Probably crap. And I started going through it. And I, was, I would read these essays and say, oh, wow. And then I'd read another and say, whoa, that's really funny. I'd read another one and say, whoa. And so I thought, these, these need to be collected. And there were maybe a dozen. But as I started writing them, the next thing I knew, there were 49 of them. And wow. I knew and uh, so that's uh, that's kind of the genesis of this little book. Da, 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 da. Now, are in in reflecting on your work and the forty nine stories, mm -hmm. do you look back and say, "Boy, I left this one out," or do you look back and say, "Boy, I should not have included that one"? That's a that's a really good question. Um, there are stories, these stories all, for the most part, well, no, some of the stories are period pieces. They literally, as stories, they, and they're all true. There's no fiction here. But some of the stories about, say, ancestors of mine in the, in the 1800s, I'm not in those stories. But every other story stars me, which is to say, I didn't want to write stories that would star someone else because maybe they didn't want that and yeah. i i for some of the pictures in the in the book i had to get releases for the people who were in the pictures because they're alive and they're not me and um one person asked me I, and these were her words i would like to not start in your book please so i <laughs> i showed her that mercy and as you know um 
not everybody in my family would want to be written about for any number of reasons. So it right. was it, right. a self-censoring thing, I guess. But I don't have regrets because stories I didn't think of in time for the book became the fodder for my podcast. And so I have a weekly podcast in which I tell a similar story to those in the book. And I'm 30, 40 stories into that. I, I wow. think wow. you're probably the same way because you are a writer. A writer can find anything to be interesting. Yeah, I, I, I tell people that writing, particularly fiction writing, there's a story every day. All you have to do is look for it. But mm -hmm. I want to talk about some of the themes in, in a second, takeaways. But we do have a winner. So, Grace, who's our winner, the first winner of the night? Yes. Yeah, so the person who got it correct was Nancy Campbell Gorski. And the answer was Tony Bennett because the record skipped when he was lip syncing. Correct. Yeah. It's an interesting thing. Bruce Morrow was it's kind of a hard head. I mean, he's set in his ways and he, he told Tony, we're not doing live tonight. We're lip syncing. Tony wanted to sing and the record stuck and started skipping. And Tony never spoke to Bruce Morrow again. It's a, it's a true story. Congratulations, Nancy. Um, yes. Glad she's on. Uh, Let's let's talk about the book for a second in general and some of the things I felt when I read it. Mm -hmm. and, but but first, I want to start by putting up the picture of you horsing around. I think you're doing a handstand at the beach. Um, <laughs> that yep. one. So there you are. You, that, you, that was last you're week. clowning. You're having a good time. Um, oh, yeah. That's probably on the Jersey Shore, I would imagine. Uh huh. <laughs> um, but as I, as I read through the stories, many of them were sad and somber, right? There was even, even in some of the funny ones. Yes. And what were you, and one of the impressions I got was that trying stuff started to mean trying to get it right, trying to that, find that place in life and get it right. Uh, and get through the pain. Tell me what, what you felt. Well, it's interesting. The title, of course, is a double play. You know, I mean, it's the stuff that happened was very trying sometimes. But I go on and I keep trying things. I never give up. And so that's kind of who I am. And a lot of things in my life have been not very pleasant. Um, I have spent time in a mental hospital. I have had uh, some horrific uh, accidents, uh, you know, on, automobile accidents. And I've also um, had my heart broken a few times. And I also, uh, I think that doesn't make me much different from everybody else. But something that has been a huge inspiration to me, that was my mother. You know, you were just talking about how a, a fiction writer can find a story in just about anything. My mother, who was most of her life quadriplegic and living someplace she didn't want to be, never failed to find the humor in every situation, every situation. And so in writing the stories from my life, I tried to put smiles in as many of them as I could, but I also needed to be honest. You know, if I wrote a book that was just all the only the good things that happened to me in my life, it'd be half the length and a quarter of a quarter as interesting, in my opinion. Um, here's how funny my mother was. I love telling this story about my mother. My father got this was in the 19 late 1950s, maybe early 60s. He got a barbecue grill, which was really a thing. I mean, who the hell had a barbecue grill in their yard? My father did. He was so proud. And he went out into the yard and he cooked up this food. And I'm sure that you you are, because you're a human male in the United States of America, Ralph, you've probably barbecued food outside. The hardest thing to cook right is chicken. It seems like it would be the easiest, but it's really hard to do well on a grill. But my father was kind of arrogant and he went out there and he cooked chicken and he brought in this giant tray of, of chicken and there's a big group around, a big family group around the table. 
And he came in with this and he put the platter down on the table. And my mother took one look at it and she said, what the heck is that? Joan of Arc's feet? <laughs> uh, that's pretty funny. That's pretty funny. But we'll, let's, I, want to give, I want to give the uh, second question out and then we'll get back to the themes. Um, because I want to talk about the way some some of the stories, the way you build them up, and and I don't want to give them away, but then they have such gripping endings uh, to them. Um, so the second question of the night, and, and this may be the easiest one, we're gonna we're gonna put it right back to baseball because it is baseball season. What baseball player had the first Louisville Slugger? Oh, that's your trivia so which, question. You're not that's asking a trivia me. Question. No, I'm not asking you. So if you know the answer, don't say it. Which baseball player was the first to order a, a Louisville slugger? So um, some, of, some of the stories, you know, hit hard because of you did face a lot of crosses, right? From sexual harassment to sexual uh, uh, abuse. Uh, in the form of rape and other things, but yet you you were able to come through those by talking about them, um, setting them up in a funny way sometimes, but then talking about them very realistic. Yes. Right? And was that a natural way that you were writing this, or did you do that uh, in, to, intentionally? Um, well, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna come at that from from the side. I have been in one type of uh, therapy or another since I was in my teens. And I've had some really fine therapists who've helped me uh, deal with things that were, were, were pretty damned awful. And uh, I credit those persons. They uh, advice, sometimes in talk therapy, you don't get advice. You just get the opportunity to blather. And I, I know I've done a lot of that, but I also had one therapist who urged me to do volunteer work and not just, well, real hands-on volunteer work with people who really were a hell of a lot worse off than I. And it sounds so corny, but it's so true because that sort of experience really gets you out of yourself. And, uh, Two of, I think, my most touching stories, and I think one might be podcast only and the others in the book, but was um, working with blind children. And it was at a school in Maryland for the name of the school at the time itself would bring tears. The name of the school was the Maryland School for the Blind and Multiply Handicapped. And so these were children to whom life had really, really dealt some awful blows. And I would go there and read them their homework because some of them were not even capable of typing or reading Braille. They were that, you know, that handicapped. And so I went several days a week, several evenings a week, and read homework to these kids. And I became popular. And after we finished the homework, then they would be asking me questions about the real world, the world outside that school. And it certainly made me realize uh, how fortunate I am, no matter what specific individual things ever happened that were scary or terrible. Here were these kids and they, they were so alive and they were so interested in things. And I, I just loved it. They were all about 12 or 13 years old. And I'm pretty sure this story is only on the podcast. So it really isn't, but it's going to blow, it's not going to blow this for anybody. While I was doing that volunteer work at that school, I got, I got pregnant. And so I was coming to read them their homework and they, obviously they couldn't see me, but I was getting bigger and bigger. And I talked to their teachers and their teachers gave me permission to let the children touch me. And it was unbelievable. It was just unbelievable. And of course, these kids are 12 or 13. What do they know? But they got to put their hands on my belly and feel a baby kick and really understand something that they could not possibly have otherwise understood. 
And then, of course, my, my child was born, and I took some time away from volunteering there. But then I returned, and the first time I came back, I had a baby with me. And they could feel that <clears throat> the belly was empty now, and they got to hold the baby. Wow. And uh, so, yeah, some, some awful things have happened to me in my life, but some in incredibly beautiful things that happened and and I enjoy writing about those too right and there are there are lots of beautiful stories in here and and there's a lot of fun times you have with a couple of characters we're going to talk about those in a second but we do have a winner to the second trivia question and Grace the winner is the winner is Michelle D'Amato and the correct answer which she got was Babe Ruth that is absolutely correct so we yeah. see Nancy and, and, and Michelle are both back and right at it. I don't know if Kelly signed in today, but we'll have to see. Hey. <laughs> um, so anyway, let's Effie. Uh, I think she, she was your grandmother, correct? Effie was my grandma. Oh, please. We've right. got such a picture of her. We have a, I think there's a picture of her. Now but she seemed is. to be, she seemed to be a person that provided you with a lot of, uh, of, um, um, background for your charismatic side. <laughs> Talk about she, Effie. Effie. Effie was my grandfather's second wife. His first wife, my biological grandmother, died very, very young and horribly. And um, not too long thereafter, my grandfather married the woman you see on the left here with the hat and the fancy shoes, and she's hanging outside a, a saloon with some of her buddies. She Here's how she met my grandfather. He was involved in theater and they had a road company that was traveling through Pennsylvania and she wondered what was going on. And so she, get ready, rode her 1920 something Indian motorcycle down the dirt road to where they were setting up these tents for the performance. Well, I don't sing well, but I'm gonna try. Da, 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 da. It was a magic <laughs> moment. He fell in love with her. She fell in love with him. And they were married in no time. And so, I, you know, I had a grandmother who rode, rode a, a motorcycle in the 1920s. And she encouraged me to do things that were maybe risky, but would pay off in exciting times. She was just... A, a, an amazing gal. She thought that everyone was beautiful. And she would tell you that. I said, "What? So what did you do today?" And she said, oh, "I went to I went to the supermarket. Oh, the girl who checked me out, what a beautiful girl. What a lovely person." That's what she saw. She saw that in absolutely everyone. So she was very inspiring to me in that way. And she lived to be 99 years of age. So I got a a, a lot of Effie. A lot of Effie. Um, she kept her hair red till she was about maybe 85 or 90. And, but in the years following up, or I should say leading up to that, she loved to tell this story. She said, sometimes people ask me, is your hair real? Are you, are you a real redhead? And she would say, if you can see me, I am. <laughs> <laughs> But I want to I want to give the audience the third trivia question. And then I want I want you to talk about some of those edgy times that you had that you think came about because of Effie. You know, where you went out and did a little bit of a free spirit kind of thing. So the, the, right. the third question for the night is um, is about New Jersey and and the and music. So we've tied New Jersey and music together. So, which of the legendary music star uh, music stars was born in New Jersey? Uh, Bob Gaudio of the Four Seasons, Lady Gaga, Art Garfunkel, Gloria Gaynor, or Madonna? Which of the following, which music star of the following group was born in New Jersey? Lady Gaga, Bob Gaudio, Gloria Gaynor, Art Garfunkel, and Madonna. So yeah, tell the audience. So so what 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 free spirit experience do you want to share? Uh, 
I mean, you had a few, so. <laughs> uh, I know you had a few because some you say in the book, I'm leaving the details out. <laughs> so. Well, sometimes you have to leave the details out. Uh, one that I, I told recently on my, my podcast that was really funny is that my mother had this girlfriend named Rosie. And Rosie had a daughter named, well, her real name was Roseanne. In the book, I changed the names, but here, come on, these people. So one day, and Rosie, Rosie's prized possession was her Buick. She had this 1950-something Buick that was easily the size of my bedroom now. And with tons of chrome on it, the thing was unbelievable. And she would drive to, my, to, my, to our house to come over and visit my mother. She lived three blocks away, but she always wanted to drive the car wherever she went. And so... One day she came over with her daughter with the expectation that we two girls would play together in my room while the women got to talk about women's stuff. Well, I wasn't there. I was playing with another friend named Patty who lived down the street. And so Rosie's daughter said, Mom, can I go out to the car? I want to get a book I left in the car. Her mother gave her the keys. Moments later, 12-year-old Roseanne and 12-year-old Rita were on a joyride through Lindhurst, New Jersey. <laughs> now, we were 12. I, why in the world? But it just seemed like such a good idea. Well, you know, it was, it was obviously a standard transmission, and she had been practicing in their driveway, going backwards and forwards. So she knew how to do that. The turns were something entirely new, entirely new. And her mother, of course, quickly realized the Buick was gone, and so was her daughter. And so her mother, who was Italian-born, heads out on the sidewalk to catch us. And she's running through the streets screaming, Rosa man, Rosa man, Rosa man! And of course, <laughs> this does no good. And then she sees us because the town was in a little grid. And so now and then, she'd see us go by, and she'd switch streets, and she'd come running after, go to Rosa man! <laughs> and eventually what happened was that we turned a corner and went up a slight hill and the car stalled. She couldn't, she didn't know how to downshift. And so it just stalled. And our solution to that was to leave the keys in the car and run in two different directions. So that evening we're sitting at the dinner table, my mother and father and I, and my mother says, a terrible thing happened today. And my father says, what was that terrible thing? And my mother says, Roseanne took her mother's car and went on a joyride. And then the two of them looked at me, expecting me to say, oh, hers. And here's what I said. I know I was in the car. I, you know, I've never learned to lie. I just, and that's, I guess that's important to my book. I'm just not a liar at heart. And so when I tell my stories, I tell what really happened. And uh, some of the stories I make a complete fool of myself, as I kind of did that day, because my parents didn't know. Ro Roseanne hadn't ratted me out, but I know I was in the car. So yeah, yeah. that's, why would I do that? Well, Grandma Effie, you know, Grandma Effie would have done that. <laughs> Probably, you have you have two other uh, female characters, uh, Muff Muffy, yeah, and Donna. Mm -hmm. So um, Donna we're going to announce wasn't. the winner. Then we're going to come back to those two. So we have a winner for the third the third um, question. All right, so Nancy got the answer correct again. She's already won, but Kelly McConomy came in like right split second behind her, and she they both said Gloria Gaynor. That's the correct answer. That's good. So Kelly, Nancy, and Michelle, congratulations, sir. Our Bravo. big trivia trio is at it tonight, I tell you. Yeah. <laughs> um, the... Uh, uh, yeah, talk a little bit about uh, Donna and then talk about Muff. The particular one with Muff has to do with the, the foot thing going to oh, yeah. Lake Tayaconga or something. But anyway, talk about Donna. You, you like to travel with her. 
yeah, I told you I have hundreds of cousins. Donna is one of the best. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to rate your cousins, but sometimes you have to. So she is one of the best. And um, she and I had some hilarious travel experiences. And we also had some heart-rendering family events that we shared in our lives. And we're, she's very dear to me. Uh, she lived in, she grew up in New Jersey, but she went to school in New England and her field, this is kind of weird. I don't know if you know anybody else in this field. Flavor. She worked for a company that makes the flavors they're in foods. So mm. when you see artificial flavoring, the magic that made it actually taste like an orange, that's what she did. And uh, so she got a job offer in Zurich and lived abroad for three years and traveled all over the world while she was doing that. And then uh, came back when those three years were up, she came back to Jersey to uh, work again and went in a different direction because she had seen so much of the world and she had, uh, she knew food, food science, she knew marketing, she understood world economy, and she began to um, travel to, to emerging nations to help women uh, create a, a business out of what they could do. It might be making cookies, it might be uh, making cloth, whatever. She would go and stay there for months and in horrific conditions and so and help these people so she's a wonderful an interesting woman in her own right and um and she's just a great sidekick we had so much fun we went to uh newport rhode island and i didn't know anything about newport rhode island and it was just really fun because of the big portuguese community there and those people are there because they came over as servants to live to as live in servants in those giant mansions that the this country's wealthiest people built on those cliffs and it was just really it was it was interesting what a what a population there was there and the wonderful restaurants that it led to and also you didn't have to walk two blocks to find somebody to read your palm so we did, <laughs> we had our palms read that was a lot of fun and then the next trip we took together was to Quebec, and we had a fabulous time, a fabulous time, and I recommend Quebec City to anybody for a vacation. It's Europe without the ocean to go across. It's just so European and so beautiful and so international, and as we were leaving the inn that we stayed in, which was right on the river, right on the St. Lawrence River, as we were leaving, it was surreal. It was like a dream sequence because as we were walking out all these men were walking in and every one of them was gorgeous and built oh my god the muscles and their these strapped t-shirts and shorts and bulging oh my gracious and I think must have been a dozen of them well it turned out that the week following our week in Quebec was a a national uh, contest uh, athletic contests in which firemen, policemen, EMTs, people like that were competing. It was like an Olympics for them, only it was in Quebec, and about 20 of them were standing <coughs> in the that we were leaving. So if I've ever been sad to leave a place, that was the saddest I've ever been, leaving a place, because all those gorgeous men had just checked in and we had just checked out. So that was one of our trips. <laughs> Now, Muff, the, the last person we'll talk about tonight. And then... Muff is an interesting woman. She and I became friends when uh, we were in our 20s and just by chance were living in the same apartment com complex and became really good friends. And she, um, she is half Ojibwa Indian. Her mom was, uh, was Ojibwa and her father was uh, some kind of white guy who <laughs> taught at a French school in Baltimore. And so he unfortunately passed away very, very young and her mother was left with what they had created for summers. 
and it was a girls canoeing camp in, in a remote lake in a remote part of Ontario, Canada, where her mother had grown up. And so we went and spent two weeks in this very primitive camp. It wasn't operating as a girls canoeing camp anymore, but the lake, the lake was 600 feet deep. Think about that. I don't swim, so it, <laughs> but we, I learned canoeing and we would canoe 12 miles each way to the Hudson Bay store to get milk or whatever. It was just, it was a fascinating, fascinating vacation. And while we were there, of course, in a place like that, there's no, the, the skies are astounding at night, just astounding. And we were sitting there looking at the moon one night and we knew, we knew what had just happened because it was July of 1969. And a man had just landed on that moon. And it was an interesting place to be viewing it from because it was, it was so primitive, so primitive. So uh, she and I have been friends ever since. She lives in Connecticut now. We don't see each other very often, but there's a lot of love that's still there. And um, she and I got into some mischief. And one big mischief was that she wanted to go to a party I didn't want to go to, but her car wasn't running or something. So I drove her to this party I didn't want to go to where I was bored to death. And then this man sat down next to me who 19 days later was my husband. Oh, wow. So, what if Muffy hadn't wanted to go to that party? Life is full of those, those intersections, though. And I think sure they're fun are. to write. They're, they're really fun to write about. That, the day that you did that instead of this, the road not taken or whatever. And uh, yeah. it makes life interesting. It sure does. Especially and back. There's, as I said, there's a story out there every day. You just have to look for it. Yep. And um, so, Rita, what's next? What's, you write another book? Do you expand on your memoirs? Do you go in a different direction? What's next? Well, as you, as you do know, and, and some of the people who are watching with us tonight know, I started a podcast. I had to because as soon as the book was published, I realized I had all these stories I hadn't told yet. And I could tell them one at a time. So my podcast is called Rita with a W. Rita Writes and Reads. And it's, it's anywhere you listen to podcasts, it's there. And every week I tell a new story. A new story drops every Thursday morning. And uh, it's given me the opportunity to continue to be a storyteller from my life. Uh, I'll be 78 in June. So well, a lot has happened. Okay. <laughs> it's uh, 39, 39 times, right? That's the 39th anniversary of your 39th birthday. That's right. That's right. And I imagine the gifts will really pour in. Um, <laughs> you, uh, you, uh, you already asked me about Effie. Is there anybody else you want to ask me about? Uh, no, is there anybody that you may want to tell about that we haven't touched on? Um, well, I, I had two, I had two marriages and divorces and we're not going to go there. But uh, my first husband, who is my son's father, was the quintessential hippie and we lived a quintessential hippie life in amongst people who were quint quintessential hippies and that was a lot of fun and uh in the midst of that i discovered i was gonna have a baby so thank you muffy thank you for taking me to that party uh, here's my, my son and a lot of beautiful you it don't was know my what, second what direction it might have gone that's right. Fair. And it was my second husband who threw me that 39th birthday party. <laughs> and, and it went on for a few years. And so yep. you have to pick yes, it, it back did. up. You have to throw it, you know, you have to throw your own party. Say, you know, 39th, uh, 39th of the 39th birthday. But, I like that. But, I like that. I hadn't yeah. thought of it. So it's, it's been wonderful having you on. I uh, appreciate it. I think our fans um, know little more about you now than they did 45 minutes ago. Uh, the book is a terrific read. It's touching, it's funny, uh, it's real, and um, you know, very enjoyable uh, work. So thank you for coming on. And, um, if, and I, 
I guess we can't tell people. My book, I just want to say one thing about the book. It's not on yeah. Amazon. It's not on Bards and Noble. But How did they get it? Through my publisher. And the okay. name of my publisher is Mariner, like people who go in boats, Mariner Media. And they're right okay. here in Virginia, and they did a beautiful job with my book. Fabulous. Thank you Good. so much, Ralph. Thank you for coming on. And, you know, we'll be in touch and, you know, and uh, we'll, we'll keep tabs. We'll watch that podcast and, uh, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what the future holds. You get another book out there, we'll have you back on. <laughs> well, the, the podcast might turn into a book. <laughs> That's good. Um, they're fun. They're fun. Have a blast with it. But Thank you, dear. Good night. But try, good night. See ya. Jazz hands. Oh, yes, I think uh, Grace should cut on here in a second. Hi, guys. Hi. Um, here, I'll pull everyone back up so we can say thank you. Thank you guys so much for being thank on you. tonight. That was a great show. And thank Two you, Grace. Weeks, we have another uh, a woman author, Angela Dawson, who wrote um, – a uh, fictional tale about uh, being a Greek immigrant and coming to the United States and the trials and tribulations that goes through that. So, you know, we've got so many wonderful people writing about their past and telling their stories. And I'm just so lucky to to be able to talk to them and hear what they have to say. And it brings back, some are new, some are retreads from your own life, some are just different. It's, it's a blast. So I enjoy it. So in two weeks, Angela Dawson, Generations. Um, so fabulous. And again, so thank you, Rita. We'll you Thanks soon. again. Good night, everyone. All right. Night. Thank you both. All right, everyone. That does it for tonight's episode of ZTV. That was, that was an amazing conversation. And I'm so excited to read the book and I am excited to tune in two weeks from today to watch Ralph's next interview and add another book to my list. Until then, tomorrow we have ZTV again, as always, at 7 o'clock on our Facebook. We are meeting with Kathy Kelly and Joe Proctor of Shenandoah Caverns. They have so much history to tell about how the caverns were discovered and how the family of attractions came to be. There's about five separate attractions on the property. So tune in tomorrow to learn all about that. And then Thursday is another Make It Alexandria with Elisa Kovach of Alexandria Makers Market. And she will be welcoming Lost Boy Cider. So until then, be the good news in someone's life.